As per usual, content warning and spoiler warning for the game. El Penitente in Spanish, or The Penitent, wakes up surrounded by his dead brothers. Donning his helmet, he grips his sword, the Mea Culpa. He would venture out into the now cursed world of Custodia, warped and tortured as punishment for their guilt by the grievous miracle, which acts with a force of God, tormenting the surviving inhabitants of this land. The Penitent would rise up to free the people of their suffering, absolving them of their guilt and sin, taking it on himself, and he would strike down the high wills and perform the ultimate blasphemy to refuse the divine fate. All right, let's kick off our list. Number one, the penitent, El Penitente. While you were out sinning, the penitent was studying the way of the blade. At the beginning of the game, the penitent wakes up in a sea of corpses. He's the last surviving member of the Brotherhood of Silent Sorrow. The Brotherhood had been destroyed by the miracle. For some reason though, the miracle has brought one of the Brotherhood back to life and made him unable to truly die. If killed, he would just revive again. His weapon is the Mea Culpa. The Mea Culpa was born out of a woman's prayer to the grievous miracle, seeking absolution of guilt. As she was pounding her chest with a statuette, the miracle turned the statue into a long sharp shape of a sword, responding to her prayer, impaling the praying woman and turning her into stone. Wielding the Mea Culpa, the penitent will be the protagonist of the game. Having taken a vow of silence, he won't make a noise even if hurt or killed. The penitent quickly learns that the miracle has assigned the warden of the Sullen Sorrows to patrol these halls in, in case of any survivors. Taking the warden down, the penitent fills his helmet with blood and puts it on, starting off on his journey of guilt and revenge against the miracle and the high wills for the misery they've wrought over the faithful people of Custodia and the slaughter of his brotherhood. The fate of Custodia, leaving the Brotherhood of Silent Sorrows, getting our bearings from Del Gracias, we'll start to learn about the fate of Custodia. Through the background art, the monster designs, the villagers crucified in the form of the Twisted One, we see firsthand the suffering of Custodia under the whims of the uncaring, all-powerful miracle, the evil or at least uncaring god or deity. The miracle has a tendency for answering prayers in a form very similar to the monkey paw, granting the faithful what they ask for, but in the worst way possible. A good example is the woman we mentioned just a little bit ago in the video, turning a statuette into a sword so that she wouldn't pale herself. And we'll learn a few more of these stories later on in the video. We see people crucified just like the Twisted One, who is at the center of the custodian fate. It's said that the Twisted One prayed to the miracle to absolve him of his guilt. So the miracle caused the log he sat on to begin to twist and contort around his body. And as they became one, he never cried or complained. This event is considered the first miracle. The areas outside Albero have become a wasteland. The miracle has decided this area needed to pay more penance and tore down the churches and their towers. Let loose a miasma of disease to kill all the plants and life. The townsfolk are crucified along the road, and some held over fire pits. Fire had traditionally been used to represent a cleaning or purification, so they were likely put into the situation as a form of penance and punishment to purge the townspeople of their sin and guilt. The different backstories of the different areas tell a story through melancholic depictions, sadly telling stories of a faithful people who had fallen to the miracle a beautiful world of people, arts, and towns, since fallen, and only the ruins remain to tell the story of what once was. Number three, the weight of her burden. One of the earliest enemies we meet in the adventure of the penitent, and in my opinion, one of the first enemies that starts setting blasphemous aside, showing off its art direction. At the start of the game, the first two enemies we see appear to be more standard video game fare. A bandit with a knife 
and a disheveled man who will strike you with a wheel, the enraged pilgrim and the wheel-wielding pilgrim, respectively. But meeting these women carrying these statues that they are attached to, I think lets you know what to expect for the rest of the game in terms of design and atmosphere. Bound with chains to statues, the miracle had these women tied up as penance for their guilt. Now, the surviving ones roam the land of the buried church, attacking anyone they see with their still attached statue. They look emancipated and grievously wounded, yet they still muster the determination and will to use the weight of the massive statues they are chained to as weapons. These tormented women also serve as physical representations of the burden of carrying guilt and sin, highlighting the main narrative themes of the game. The Brotherhood of the Kissers of Wounds Led by the noble Tirso, the Brotherhood of the Kisser of Wounds are one of the last surviving groups we find in the world of Blasphemous. They labor tirelessly in Albero, trying to save and ease the suffering of the survivors of the grievous miracle. Through a quest in which we collect healing herbs for Tirso and his Brotherhood, we learn the story of what happened at Albero. At around the same time as the miracle appeared, and started cursing and punishing the people. An infectious disease has started to spread across Custodia. One day, a young man sought out Tirso's congregation looking for help and relief from this disease, wondering what his unforgivable sin had been to receive such a condemnation. From here, the disease spread across the city, weakening and killing more of the survivors of the recent catastrophes. The holy men and women were distraught at the suffering of their flock around them. They had no way to alleviate the suffering of the faithful. An item description tells us, On one of the nights during which the young man agonized, amidst terrible febril tremors, with the wounds that plagued his body spreading more and more, I approached him so distraught that I held him in my arms and, shedding tears, I kissed him on the forehead. While I felt the ardor of his forehead on my lips, I noticed the young man was opening his eyes and looking at me, his agony apparently gone all of a sudden. The grievous miracle was fickle and didn't act in any way that humans could comprehend. Its divine will didn't need to explain itself to mortals. It would condemn and bless as it wanted. Just like the miracle had plagued the land with disease, it had also blessed the congregation with the ability to heal with just a kiss. And thus, the Brotherhood of the Kisser of Wounds was formed. They would take refuge in a house in the middle of Obero and provide shelter and relief as best as they could to the survivors, using the unknown magic of their kisses to heal. A detail I liked was that as you provide herbs to the Brotherhood, the town starts to come to life in the background. Presumably, people the Brotherhood has helped with items you've brought them. One by one, they start to reappear, which lets you know how vibrant life in Albero is becoming again. Approaching the end of the game, we see some villagers struggle to get a massive pig onto a cart. Look at the size of that big boy. In some cultures, pigs are used to symbolize wealth and prosperity. So I think the pig here is meant to show that the town is flowing with life and activity again. Look at him, he's a big happy piggy. A lot of the imagery of the Brotherhood seems to be based off of San Francisco de Assis. St. Francis of Assis, I think. San Francisco was an Italian mystic and a Catholic friar who founded the religious monastical order of the Franciscans, one of the three main male religious orders within the Roman Catholic Church along with the Jesuits and the Dominicans. Deo gracias. His name is a combination of thanks and God, Dios and gracias. So we can take his name to mean to be thankful to a God. Deo gracias is the first friendly NPC we meet in the game that sets us off on our first objective, to complete the three humiliations to get access to the Mother of Mothers Cathedral. Deo gracias is the only direction we get in a lot of the game and he quickly becomes a welcome sight, guiding us to our next objective. Wearing a capirote style hat and dressed in shibari styled rope patterns, he looms large over the penitent, like so many other figures in this world. His knees bloodied and scratched from being on them for so long, 
He will guide the penitent to the turned throne that the penitent will need to reach to get the true end of the events of Blasphemous. And he will observe and record the penitent's journey in custodia. Deo Gracias seems to have knowledge of how things will play out, or an ability to let him know what the future holds. In the canon ending of the game, he would observe the penitent climb the mountain of ash in a attempt to commune with the miracle by reaching the turned throne. If the penitent goes through with the ultimate blasphemy, Deo Gracias will be there to complete the penitent's voyage and set up the events for Blasphemous 2. Nacimiento Nacimiento is a giant that has been cursed by the miracle, causing him to have Benjamin Button disease. His face gets younger and younger as he ages, but he has an ancient one inside of him. To contrast his youthful appearance, we see a visage of an old man protruding on his chest, which Nacimiento is curiously probing, since he doesn't know what it is or what the miracle has cursed him with. Later in the game, the curse will progress, and we will see the old man being birthed from Nacimiento's chest start to crawl out. In his last phase, we see the old man having been fully birthed. He lays in the center of the room in the fetal position, slowly breathing. Nacimiento is non-responsive with a large hole in his chest. In part two of Blasphemous, we learn that the curse is cyclical in nature. The old man birthed from Nacimiento's chest would meet a similar fate. The old man would gradually get younger and younger, doing the Benjamin Button thing, and eventually he too would see a visage of an old man protrude from his chest and eventually start the cycle again. Altagracias When the penitent first meets Altagracias in Grievance Ascends, she appears to be a big ball of hair. The penitent hears how she was being forced into a marriage that she didn't want to participate in. The three sisters prayed for help to the miracle, which granted a grace that caused her hair to grow and grow until she could make a shell of her hair for herself. She, they, ask you to get three things for her that represent the dissolution of a marriage. A torn bridal ribbon, a grieving veil, and some melted gold coins. Three things the three sisters would need if they were to refuse their wedding vows and strike out on their own. Once all three items are collected and offered, Altagracias comes out of her shell and we see the true form of the three sisters after being touched by the miracle. She looms large over the penitent, topless and having three faces or visages merged into one with long strands of thick dark hair. She thanks the penitents for his offerings and gives him the egg of deformity. 8. The Lady of Six Sorrows, the topless health lady. In Blasphemous, you can increase your maximum health by encountering the Lady of Six Sorrows. There are six health upgrades available, one unlocked every time you encounter an instance of the Lady across the map. When encountered, she will increase the penitent's health and shortly thereafter disappear. She appears as a large woman wearing loose fitting shorts and a cardinal styled hat, and wearing nothing else, with six blades stabbed into her bare chest. I think one of her roles early on in the game like the guards in Fear and Hunger, is to throw a visual image at the player that is unexpected to keep the player on their toes and guessing. The game doesn't give us much of her lore or story, but her tone seems determined, as if she wished or prayed for this penance. She sounds eager to help the penitent. Maybe she knows what lies at the end of his pilgrimage. Maybe it will end her suffering and her penance. The Lady of Six Sorrows could also just be another poor pawn in the power struggles between the divinities, the miracle and the high will. Melchiades, the exhumed archbishop. Melchiades was an archbishop in life. In death, his body has been exhumed and decorated with lavish clothes with gold inlaid cloth and precious jewels and is now paraded by the faithful. He is an archbishop wearing holy robes, vibrant jewels, a gold-plated crown, and wielding a golden scepter. His followers witness his exhumation and some help in the process of cleansing. After being exhumed, they used wine to clean his bones, dressed him in silk, gold, and jewelry, and kissed his forehead and hands. Afterwards, the followers of Melchiades lifted him up into the air, chanted his name out loud, paraded him, and made it look like he was still alive and walking. The design for Melchiades is based off of the catacomb saints, which were the bodies of ancient Christians that were exhumed and roamed and served as relics from the 16th to 19th centuries. 
The catacomb saints were the skeletal remains of the faithful dressed up in extravagant gold outfits laden with precious jewels. Socorro, one of the more tragic characters in Blasphemous, I think. Her name, Socorro, means help in Spanish, as in asking for help. The Marks of Refuge tells us the following about Socorro. Sign of protection that freed its bearer from pain. The wounds appeared in the flesh of their lady, who once swore to suffer instead of her wards. Socorro spent her childhood in a village which lined the route that church prisoners, condemned for their crimes and sins, frequently traversed. From the window of her room, she could see how these prisoners climbed the hill in a line so that when they reached their summit, they would be ready for their punishments and physical tortures reserved for them until they died. Hearing the distant cries of the damned day and night turned Socorro into such a compassionate person that she devoted all of her time praying for those punished. So much did she pray for them to be freed of their pain and suffering that she dared ask the miracle that the physical pain they were suffering be passed on to her. As the legend goes, the wounds of lashes, cuts, and blows received by the condemned began to appear on Socorro's body, and still she prayed for them, despite all the pain transferred to her. Thus freeing the condemned from their suffering, so many injuries and so much pain were transferred to her that her body began deforming and drowning completely in wounds and bleeding bruises, but without causing her death. Her cries were so deafening that news of this miraculous event soon spread across the land. Socorro can be freed from her suffering and allowed to travel to the other side of the dream if the penitent finds the three marks of refuge and offers them to Socorro. Let's hope she finds a respite of her suffering on the other side of the dream. Jocinero Jocinero appears as a large infant that has a golden head, holding a horn that is wrapped around his left arm and seems to have hatched from a bull that can be seen torn apart around him. Upon meeting Jocinero for the first time, he will ask the penitent one to find the children of the moonlight. Collecting the first 20 will allow him to be birthed from a bull and allow the penitent to enter the painting and speak with him, receiving the much needed linen of golden threads, which allows the penitent to fall into chasms without being hurt. Jocinero describes himself as, I was born of the moon and of the torment of a brave bull, and from myself, by the grace of the high wills, my holy brethren. I was curious if there was any historical reference with the name Jocinero, so I looked it up, and apparently the name Jocinero might come from the name given to a bull that killed a professional bullfighter in a bullfighting match in Madrid in the 1860s. The Blessed Lord of Salty Shores The Blessed Lord of Salty Shores is a melancholic figure that we encounter by warping into his realm from the fountain in Albero. His realm is still and quiet, covered in what seems to be like snow at first, but it's really salt. We see the blessed lord of the salty shores frozen in time, unable to move, still sitting in his throne, overlooking his frozen realm and followers. They had all been cursed by the miracle for their heresy and worshipping something that wasn't the miracle. From the wiki, Blessed Lord of Salty Shores has claimed to have been worshipped as a saint by the people that surrounded him. He used salt as blessings, which led his worshippers to strongly believe it was blessings. The miracle found out about the lies he had been doing and sentenced him and his worshippers to be trapped as statues of salt inside his realm. Despite the curse, he longs for someone to bring him items which he can bless and turn into relics in order to lift the curse and escape. 13. The Order of the Shard Visage Traveling up the mountain, past where the olive trees used to grow, we start to see frozen, exhausted corpses of pilgrims making their way up to the covenant of Our Lady of the Shard Visage. The mountains in the background have portraits of wailing nuns carved into it that is visible from everywhere in the valley, a haunting reminder of the cost of faith in the world of Custodia. Reaching the Covenant, the penitent is resisted by mass-covered nuns, the followers of the Lady. Eventually, the penitent will encounter the Lady himself and fight her as part of completing his humiliations. We learn about the Lady, the Covenant, and her origin from the Golden Thimble item description. A young villager named Aurea had such a beautiful and pious face that even as a child, statue sculptors took her as a model for their creation. Her face became so recognizable 
that little by little, people took her as a living, breathing image of divinity, until it reached a point where they ended up taking her out on processions and even replacing their own images. Such was the fervor around her that she could not bear to be mistaken with the divinity and burned her face with boiling oil to give her pious beauty to God and took up the habits of a convent. The years passed and she started showing natural signs of aging, just like her companions, except for the burn, which remained as fresh as the moment the boiling oil had spilled. The wound was still smoking, scorching, and reeking. This was understood to be a miracle, and she was canonized in life by the church. She became known as Our Lady of the Charred Visage. An order was founded in her name, where all the existing nuns, as well as those who wanted to take up the habit, had to burn their faces in the same way as Aurea had. She wears a golden mask under which she hides the gauze that alleviates the eternal pain that the burn still inflicts on her. Soledad Soledad is a jailed ghost imprisoned in a golden cage. When you first meet her, she asks you not to be afraid of her. She was locked up on the orders of her holiness, and then the miracle proceeded to decorate her cage. She says her purpose now, as ordained by the high wills, is to wait here in her cage for the penitent to bring her knots for her to mend to the rosary. She is to wait here sleeping for when the penitent needs her help. Her name Soledad is very fitting for her plight. Soledad in Spanish means solitude or loneliness. So just like her name, she is condemned to wait here in solitude until fulfilling her aid to the penitent, at which point she'll be able to cross over to the other side of the dream and finally get some rest. Okay, and for our next item on our list, something that's not nasty, but I did find surprising or shocking in a very positive way. As I was traveling through the city of Albero, at one point I encountered the very pleasant surprise of a puppy. As Albero repopulates and life comes back to it, we can see this cute little guy making an appearance. He's so happy to see the penitent and say hi. As my wife insisted I include in this video, the rules of good game design state that if there is a puppy in the game, it must be interactable. Dear game developers, do not put a dog in the game if you do not give us the ability to pet the dog. And I'm happy to report that is in fact the case here in Blasphemous. Along with the pig in the background and the other residents of Albero, the puppy making an appearance is a sign that you can see that the city is healing as you give the brotherhood of the wound kissers more and more herbs. It's a very small little detail with no other implications or, or ramifications for the game, but I thought it was cute. The Holy Guardian Visages The Holy Guardian Visages are encountered after completing any of the three humiliations in the first half of the game, as the penitent is trying to get access to the Mother of Mothers. They appear as giant floating heads, partially covered in molten gold, never steady, always flowing up and down, and having this unnerving little twitch to them giving them an uncomfortable vibe. In the background of these encounters, we see waves of soil with frozen human figures in them, hauntingly capturing the last moments for these individuals as they appear to have been caught up in waves of soil and they were then frozen by the miracle. Created by the miracle, the Holy Guardian Visage guard the three holy wounds the penitent is seeking. We meet the Visages after fighting the Tempiedad, her Lady of the Charred Visage, and the Three Anguishes, Las Tres Angustias. Once the Three Holy Wounds are collected, the cathedral doors will open to the penitent so that he may continue his journey to the Churned Throne and attempt to commune with the miracle. The Bone Collector and the Ossuary Near the sanctuary in Albero, you will find the ossuary that has had all the bones inside of it ransacked and stolen. The caretaker asks you for your help to retrieve them as you progress through your journey. He talks about the singing that he can hear from the bones and how they need to be taken care of and soothed so that the spirits of the bones are, are able to rest. As they are collected, the descriptions of the bones gives us short snippets of the stories of the person that it used to belong to. The caretaker is covered by flowing sand, representing the ever inevitable flow of time which leads to the death of all living things. As more and more bones are collected, we see that the amount of flowing sand increases until the caretaker is covered up to his neck in ever-flowing sand. 
The theme of collecting holy bones and the visual themes of this room are reminiscent of the real-life Chapel of Bones in Portugal, which was built with the bones and skulls of over 5,000 frères. And for our next item on the list, another pleasant surprise, Miriam. When I was playing through Blasphemous, I was deliberately trying to do a blind run-through of the main game in the DLC to try to explore and discover as much as I could by myself. And I should add that I've been a fan of Metroidvanias since I played Symphony of the Night, the game that started the entire genre. So I was very pleasantly surprised when I saw Miriam from Bloodstained Ritual of the Night in Blasphemous. Bloodstained was made as a sort of spiritual successor to Symphony of the Night. I had a chance to play through it not too long ago and check it out. I really enjoyed the crystal mechanics, the characters, along with the cool monster designs and the general atmosphere and art direction. So it was just really cool to see Miriam show up in Blasphemous as a cameo for the DLC and see her hang out momentarily with the Penitent. Exposito, Scion of Abjuration. Exposito, Scion of Abjuration, appears as a giant baby with his bleeding eyes blindfolded and is being held by a, a wicker woman. Exposito's mother, was accused of witchcraft by the Inquisition and sentenced to be burned. When she was being tied up and her sentence was to be carried out, she begged for her child to be spared from the sight of having to see her being burnt. From the wicker knot item description, we know, when she was taken to the campfire, the Inquisitors took the baby from her arms and she screamed, begging for the child not to see her burn. The boy, who stared at her from afar, drenched in tears was blindfolded. The blindfold was immediately moistened. The bonfire was surrounded by people there to see the execution. They screamed, calling her a witch and a heretic. When the flames started licking the piles of firewood, she asked a kind soul to build a wicker figure in her image and size and to place the child in its arms so the baby would not miss her. And so they did. And when the figure was built, they placed the bawling child in his arms and the orphan immediately stopped crying. The miracle was merciful once again. There is no love like a mother's love for its child. So here we see Exposito's mother doing everything she can, even in her last moments, to try to protect her baby. During the boss fight, the penitent will not actually fight Exposito directly, but rather the snake creature that you see on screen, which relies on moving around the arena and using venom attacks. But if the penitent is not careful, Exposito might join in on the fight, pick up the penitent, and casually rip him apart. And last on our list, the High Wills. In the world and mythology of Blasphemous, the High Wills are the equivalent to the supreme deity, the all-powerful, all-knowing entity that the inhabitants of Custodia pray to. Along with the Grievous Miracle, it's one of the most powerful entities in the game. The Penitent will only come face to face with the High Wills if they are pursuing the true canon ending. After fighting Escribal three different times, once in his human form, once as the son of the Miracle, and once in his final form, the Penitent makes his way to the ancient procession, the equivalent of a heaven in Blasphemous, after communing with the Miracle. He will have the chance to come face to face with the High Wills here. Portrayed as three massive conjoined faces that cry liquid gold, the High Wills warn you there is no penance that could exonerate the ultimate blasphemy, trying to stop the penitent from doing what they know the penitent is there to do. But the High Wills' warning fall on, the, on deaf ears, as Crisanta and the penitent complete the task that they are here to do. After destroying the High Wills, the Penitent is faced with the Twisted One crumbling away in the wind along with the Mea Culpa. Crisanta and Deogracias lay the Penitent down in a sarcophagus, and the game ends with an image of the Son of the Miracle descending from the clouds, setting up the events of the second game. Hey, if you made it this far, I just want to give you a very sincere thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit through my entire video. Let me know in the comments which one of these 20 shocking things in the world of Blasphemous is going to stick out with you. And as always, thank you very much, take care, and later.